اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. This is our fourth session in uh, our tafsir of Surah Nuh, and um, the last time we stopped at verse 11, and uh, you will recall we said that uh, the Prophet uh, Nuh or Noah alayhi salam is now addressing his people once again and uh, we looked at verse 10 and 11 where he said to them he says to Allah what he said to his people فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارَ I said to them plead to your Lord for forgiveness indeed he is all forgiving يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ Midrara, he will send for you abundant rains from the sky. And a major part of our discussion there was the close relationship between um, repentance or turning back to Allah and um, inviting Allah's blessings. And we saw how um, there is a perfect system in place where uh, when we submit to Allah, then we are in unison with the rest of uh, the creation that does not enjoy free will uh, as we do. And uh, when we align ourselves with them, then we automatically begin to attract these blessings uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, along those same lines, uh, what Nuh alayhi salam promises them, one was that he will send abundant rains for you, meaning he will make your lands fertile, and you will enjoy good crops and good food. He also tells them, verse 12, And he will aid you with wealth and sons, and provide you with gardens, and provide you with streams. Now, in this verse, um, the translation I have, um, Banin has been translated as sons, but there are other translations that translate it as children. Okay? Um, and in fact, in this very same surah, um, verse 21, uh, Waladahu is mentioned as um, children, which again um, some may translate as sons. The reason sons is mentioned is perhaps because in most periods of time, uh, human beings saw sons as a source of strength and support. Daughters would normally uh, leave, they'd get married and leave and then go and support their husbands uh, and their husband's family. Um, so the more sons one had, the more um, powerful one felt. And this was very common even in the uh, pre-Islamic um, Arab culture, which is why we know from the Quran they used to bury their daughters alive and they would uh, seek uh, sons. And to some degree that culture has prevailed in many places. We know uh, many of us who have um, an understanding of the culture in India, for example. We know in India a lot of times sons are sought and when a woman finds out she is pregnant with a daughter, a lot of times they will have an abortion, right? Which Islam strongly, uh, obviously, condemns. So, no says, you know, he will bless you with children and wealth, or sons and wealth, whatever it is that they sought. But uh, Banin does not have to be sons alone. And in fact, um, in this very translation as well, of Quli Qarai, um, in chapter 17, verse 6, very similar words are given. وَأَمْدَدْنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And we aided you with wealth and banin, and there it is translated as children. Okay? Um, and there are other verses as well, if you're interested on this whole uh, constant mention of wealth and children again and again, um, you can look at these other verses where this is mentioned repeatedly. Um, and as we shall see, the idea here is that we generally go through life with two 
uh, every human being needs a sense of security and a sense of support and we go through life either seeking this sense of support uh, and security from our creator which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from our possessions our wealth and our children and we shall see other verses where there are uh, um, individuals who um, disobey the prophets and reject the message primarily because they feel um, that they have wealth and children and therefore they are um, they cannot be touched by any harm okay um, we will also see the contrast that here Nuh salam is telling them that as a blessing if you turn to Allah in forgiveness he will grant you wealth and children but uh, later we shall see in verse 21 that for some the very same wealth and children is actually a source of loss and ruin very much like the rains which is a source of blessing he promises them but when they reject his message the very same rains become a source of uh, punishment um, for them um, actually this verse here um, 2355 um, is, is very interesting in sort of explaining uh, this dependency on wealth and children um, so I'll just read it out it says أَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّمَا نُمِدُّهُمْ مِنْ مَالٍ وَبَنِينَ نُصَارِعُ لَهُمْ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ بَلْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Do they suppose that whatever, we aid, whatever aid we provide them from wealth and children or in regard to wealth and children is because we are eager to bring them good rather they are not aware meaning that is not really the case okay so the point being mentioned here is that nothing in itself is good or bad are you healthy? Is that a good thing? Depends. It's relative. Are you rich? Is it a good thing? Depends. Do you have children? Is it a good thing? Depends. Everything is relative. It can be a blessing. It can also be a curse. It can be a reward. It can also be a punishment. Depending on whether it draws you closer to Allah and makes you grateful for it or turns you away from Allah and makes you ungrateful if a blessing comes to you and through that you now don't have time for prayers or you now um, turn away from Allah um, or it brings arrogance and pride then it is a source of punishment but the very same thing can be um, a source of blessing so just as afflictions can be a punishment for transgressors and at the same time they can be a trial uh, and a source of uh, 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 purification for the good and the faithful in the very same way uh, bounties and blessings uh, bounties can be a blessing for the faithful but they can be a punishment for um, uh, for the transgressors um, and there is a whole subject and discussion to this I think I hinted at it the last time uh, there is a term in Islam called istidraj which is where Allah punishes a person by giving him what we consider to be blessings and the more he disobeys the more he turns away the more Allah gives him okay um, and this form of being punished by being given more bounties um, is, is called istidraj we have in some traditions and reports that one of the signs of a mu'min or a faithful is that every once in 40 days Allah will try him or her with a test and uh, that is why I have mentioned this before that some elders if 40 days pass and nothing bad has happened to them they get very worried you know like why why hasn't something bad happened to me you know am I being punished uh, and the hadith of course explain that bad doesn't mean your house burns down or something like that bad could mean uh, you know a headache for example or you trip on a stone or you know you lose a dollar or it could be just something very minor but there is always uh, uh, something that Allah will use as an excuse to purify uh, a, a true believer and to uh, detach them from the world and to use that as an excuse for forgiveness of some of their sins so that when they leave this world they are uh, purified um, of it so um, and and uh, there is many many references to istidraj in Nahjul Balagha for example Imam Ali alayhi salam says 
when you see that you continue to disobey your Lord and you continue to sin but he continues to shower his blessings on you then beware beware be very afraid because you're being set up okay that is what istidraj is basically in a nutshell okay now we also mentioned something um, the last time towards the end during our question answer session and many of you had left so I just want to reiterate it for those um, who may have missed it that in the initial verses of this surah verses 1 to 3 um, what Nuh had done is uh, salam, is he said to the people worship Allah be wary of him and obey me in exchange for that Allah will forgive you your sins. Okay. Um, lakum min dhunubikum. Here now, the order seems to be reversed. Instead of saying to them, do this, do this, do this, Allah will forgive you. He's saying, ask Allah for forgiveness. He will give you this, this, and this. And the reason for this is we said that um, for one who is wise and one who is intelligent, the command to worship Allah, be wary of Allah, obey me as the messenger of Allah should have sufficed. And for one who is wise, the promise of forgiveness should have been the you know, appealing reward, should have been what they wanted. But when Nuh realized that they're not interested in that, they don't get the point of the importance of being purified of sin, and he saw them to be materialists, to be uh, seeking the world. So what he did as a last attempt after he saw that they run away from him, they evade him, they put their fingers in their ears as we saw and all that, he said, okay, let's offer you the bounties of this world. You're not ready to understand the bounties of the hereafter, so now we'll do it the other way around. Turn to Allah in repentance and now he will give you of this world. And that is why you see that all these blessings that he promises Abundant rain, wealth and sons, gardens and streams, they're all worldly rewards. There's no mention of the hereafter. Okay? And uh, Allama Tabatabai as well in his Tafsir al-Mizan, he says wealth and sons essentially are specifics, but what they represent is what a human being seeks to have a comfortable life. That's what Nuh is saying to them. He will make your life uh, comfortable and enjoyable. And it is in this sense, he says, also gardens and streams are mentioned. Gardens as in, um, essentially, these are things that money or wealth can buy. Basic necessities of life, fertile land, uh, clean water, that's what the gardens and the streams represent. There are some Mufassirun who have tried to say, وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارَ refers to paradise, because there's a lot of references in the Quran of جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارَ gardens beneath which rivers flow. Uh, but most Mufassirun agree that the Jannat and Anhar mentioned here are not uh, paradise but uh, really um, gardens and streams in this world. Uh, this Jannat is obviously the plural of Jannah and Jannah is not just simply a garden as we understand as a park. Jannah is actually an orchard uh, or a garden that is filled with trees that provide a lot of shade. Okay? And that was much sought after in the Middle East, obviously in those days, with the sun's heat and so on. Okay? And there's a whole discussion to the word Jannah as well. The word Jannah actually suggests something that is hidden or shaded. Okay? For example, in one place the Quran says, إِذَا جَنَّ لَيْهِمُ layl When the night covers them. Or for example, we have um, the other form of sentient beings besides human beings are the jinn. They're called jinn because they're not visible to us. They're covered from the same word jannah. Okay? One who is um, intellectu uh, mentally handicapped okay, is called majnoon in Arabic. From the same word jannah because his intellect is hidden. It is covered. So something that is hidden uh, takes from this word Jannah, and that's the idea you get from Jannat, gardens that are very covered, shaded, hidden uh, from public view. Okay. Um, and this is, in a sense, um, you know, that set of verses where Nuh promises them 
what they would get if they ask for forgiveness. Now he goes on. He says to them, this is verse 13 now. مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارًا Okay. Now this verse itself is worth uh, just explaining because then the rest of the verses sort of flow out from this. Okay. Tarjuna comes from Raja. And this word Raja is very interesting in Arabic because Raja, even though we commonly assume it to mean hope, it actually has a dual meaning. It can mean hope or it can mean fear. The exact opposites. Okay. Depending on the context in which it is used. There are many words in Arabic that sort of have this um, idea that depending on the conjunction particle you put next to it, the meaning flips completely. Like take for example the word raghiba. Raghiba in Arabic can mean to desire something or it can mean to detest something. The exact opposite. Depending on whether you say raghiba fi or raghiba an. Right? So for example if you say raghiba fi something it means to desire something. But we have that famous hadith, an nikahu min sunnati faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Whoever detests the idea of being married is not from me. So here you have raghiba an, which gives you the opposite meaning. And it is for this reason, now with this verse, ma lakum la tarjuna lillahi waqara, the mufassirun say that in this verse it could mean both. It could mean hope, it could mean fear. The translation I have here says, what is the matter with you that you do not look upon Allah with uh, veneration. Okay? Um, let me just also explain the word waqar. Waqar is translated here as veneration. Uh, waqar is actually for an individual, it means to conduct yourself in a dignified manner. For example, and this is a term I think that is used in uh, Urdu as well, probably Farsi. Um, you know, when somebody has this strong personality, they have this waqar. When they walk into the room, you sense their personality. Okay? Or when they walk, they walk with dignity, with waqar. Yes? This was a name or a title for him? It was a title. Okay. So that's the idea, basically, one who is dignified. Okay. But in relation to Allah, what it means is to stand in awe of Him. When you stand in awe before Allah or someone mighty, then you stand with waqar in front of Him. Here you don't stand with pride, but you stand with awe. So, keeping in mind the meaning of uh, waqar, uh, some of the mufassirun say, مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ waqara is actually suggesting why do you not fear God and stand in awe in front of His greatness, in front of His adama? Okay, and then some translate the tarjuna the opposite as hope, and they say what it means is why do you not place your hope in Allah instead of others and magnify and venerate and stand in awe of Him instead of the other false gods and idols? Okay. Um, and then there are many other uh, similar sort of variations to just explain so that we understand. And none of these are wrong as such. The good thing is, as you look at all these different definitions of what it might mean, ma lakum la tarjuna lillahi waqara, it gives you a sense of what is it that Nuh was trying to say to them and why. Okay? One interpretation of this verse is that. Uh, what he was saying to them is, what is the matter with you that you do not feel ashamed before God? Now the Mufassir who says this, he says the proof is that it is reported from Imam Ali alayhi salam that once uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a group of people um, uh, bathing, they were taking a bath in public but they were naked and they didn't even have a cloth around their waist. So he says the Prophet stopped and he called out to them from far at the top of his voice, Ma lakum la tarjuna lillahi waqara. The same verse. Based on this report, if we regard it to be authentic, uh, the Mufassir says then the meaning would be, What is wrong with you that you do not feel ashamed before God? Because that is what the Prophet was trying to say to them. Okay. Um, 
And uh, there is a Sunni Mufassir who actually, um, Bayhaqi, he actually quotes from Imam Hassan salam, to say that what this verse means is what is the matter with you that you do not recognize any right of God or Allah, nor do you thank him for any blessing. So regardless of what the meaning of this verse might be or how we choose to interpret it, um, what is important here is to understand that what Nuh is trying to say to them is the reason you worship other gods, the reason you worship idols, the reason why you reject Allah and do not see him as your sustainer is because you don't stand in awe before him, that you don't hold him in due um, regard and that you are not hopeful of his mercy, essentially. Okay? And uh, it is for this reason that we will now see that from this verse onwards, the next verse onwards, right up to verse 20, um, Nuh is essentially mentioning two things. One is, what is it that Allah has done for us as human beings? Okay? And uh, the other thing is, uh, how he is the only creator of everything. So his bounties and his blessings and his being the overall creator is emphasized. Or to put this in more philosophical uh, terms, Allah's attributes are of two kinds. There are some of his essence of that and then there are some of his actions or af'al. And what we shall see are more his sifatul af'al as opposed to sifatul dhat. We shall see more of his attributes in action as opposed to his attributes in essence in the remaining verse. Right? How he has created the seven heavens, made the sun and the moon, how he has made the earth for you, how he has given you life and he shall take you back, and how he has made the earth a means for you to travel upon and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, there were essentially two problems with the idol worshippers and uh, the verses after verse 20 which we might not get to um, in this session um, will bring out a discussion on what was the cause of idol worship. There is a whole explanation because the idols are actually mentioned in verse 23 and there is a whole discussion there to say how did human beings start worshipping idols? What was their reason and so on and so forth. But at a high level here, um, what we find with human beings, and if you look at all the verses where the conversation between the prophets and the people who rejected the prophets, right? If you look at them very carefully and see what was the issue, you will find that they couldn't accept the idea that a prophet could be from amongst them, an ordinary human being. How could a human being who walks and talks and eats like us and walks in the marketplaces be from God? That was the idea, that was the objection they had. Why don't you bring a book that descends from the heavens in front of us? Or why don't you have angels with you? you know? You're like me, like you're fr flesh and blood like me. How could you be communicating with the Creator? Why don't I communicate with him. This was the idea. So human beings essentially would have two issues. One is they can't accept the idea that a human being could be a prophet. So they will either reject him or they will idolize him and add to him so much so that he becomes greater than uh, uh, what he is meant to be. In other words, they compare him to God and commit shirk. Okay? And there is a more detailed discussion to this. We could say um, essentially the idol worshippers had needed as human beings, they felt the need to have some sort of a God in front of whom they could stand in awe. Which is what Nu is saying to them. Why do you not stand in awe before God? Now, perhaps because over a period of time their hearts became uh, uh, rusty or dead or whatever you want to call it, they were not able to sense that connection to Allah. And the idea of a God whom they stand in awe was now missing in their lives. To make up for that, they may have felt the need to create you know, magnificent statues of very high stature, something 
in front of which they can stand in awe and bow before it and so on and so forth. Okay, so that need to be in awe of your creator was still there, but they replaced what should have been seeing their God with their hearts, they now wanted to see him with their physical eyes because their hearts now lost the ability to see Allah uh, as it should have been. The other issue they had is that a lot of the idol worshippers, when you study their history, you will find that they believed in one God, but they believed that the bounties were given by lower gods, whom they called Rabb. So there was Allah and there was Rabb, or the plural is Arbab. And it's a very fine discussion that really would take a lot of time to look at all the verses of Quran, but it's very easy to see when you, when you study it from this perspective. Uh, the Quran clearly says, uh, to, to you know, ask the idol worshippers who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah, right? And even to this day, if you ask people who worship idols, they will tell you we believe in one God. Okay, the idea was that they believed in one God who created everything, but this God would not get involved in creation. He just created and then he left things to be. And then there were these smaller gods. So if you wanted uh, fertile land or a child, you would pray to the god of fertility. If you were sailing on a voyage in the oceans, then you would pray to the god of the seas. If there was a thunderstorm, you would pray to the god of thunder. Okay. Uh, and they became very superstitious and started believing in all these little gods to, to do this uh, for them. Um, and one of the things that all the prophets and messengers came was to sort of pull them away from this uh, superstitious beliefs and say to them there is really only one God he is the only one who can benefit you or allow you to fall into harm and you really need to submit to him and free yourself from all these other gods okay. um, and in light of this you will now see the rest of the verses that what Nuh is trying to say to them is that all this creation you see is the one God and all the blessings and bounties you're enjoying are not from your idols. They are from the same God. He didn't just create you, but he continues to sustain you. And that is really the meaning of Rabb. Rabb is not, it's translated as Lord. But Rabb actually is one who sustains, who continues to keep something alive. Okay. Um, we also mentioned in the very first session on this surah, that Nuh salam, is regarded to be one of the first prophets or messengers who didn't just convey what was revealed to him but actually encouraged people to look inwards to indulge in introspection to think logically to think even scientifically and that is why you'll see now in these verses there is a lot of um, encouragement to reflect on yourself on your creation on your environment and you'll see him saying look at how you were created look at what you are what you have become look at the heavens look at the stars look at the moon that sort of an encouragement um, he sort of uh, is uh, is is seen to be the the um, you know one of the first prophets or the first one to encourage to, to bring that okay um, and to say, look at the stone idols you created. Do you think really these are the ones that created all this and they are the ones who cause you harm or benefit? So the first thing he says to them is, after saying, why do you not hold Allah with veneration? He says, وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا Though he has created you in stages. Okay? And this is an easy verse. The Mufassirun are very uh, unanimous on this. They say essentially the various stages are how you were created from nothing to a full human being. And they quote um, chapter 23 um, verses 12 to 14 which give a very detailed step-by-step -step explanation of how we created you from dust and from dust we created you from a drop of fluid and from this fluid you were just a little clinging mass. You were just like a little um, you know, piece of flesh that was just clinging to the womb of um, your mother. And from that, you were just a fleshy tissue. And from that, we put in bones. And then we clothed the bones with flesh again. Okay? 
and then we produced from this another creation and Allah then praises his own self Allahu ahsan al khaliqin so praise or blessed is Allah the best of creators so you're you're shown look at what you were ponder on what you are and look at what you have become and then you continue after that to go through different stages from an infant you can't speak you can't walk you crawl you start standing up on two feet you learn to balance you walk you speak you grow your intellect grows you become a child a youth right until an adult then you grow old again um, and uh, again there is a mention of this in chapter 40 verse 67 where the different stages um, are mentioned Alama al-Tabatabai in his Tafsir al-Mizan, he says this atwar, this various stages that Allah created you in, could also mean the various forms in which he has created you. In other words, within one species, look at how he made some of you male and some of you female. Okay? And look at how he made some of you of light complexion, some of you of dark complexion. How he made you of different colors, of different heights of different languages, of different uh, strengths, of different skills, of different intellects. And then even within your own um, gender and within your own culture and within your own race and even within those who might be of the same family and the same height and the same complexion, look at how each one of you has a unique skill of his own or a unique blessing to help them in their um, journey in. Uh, in life okay. right down to the fact that in one hadith from Imam al-Baqir on this verse he says that this verse وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ atwara means he created you with different desires, wishes and intentions such that you all seek Allah but you all go through different ways to get to him that is why some of the ulama say الطُرُوق إِلَى اللَّهِ بِعَدَدِ النُّفُوسِ the number of ways or paths to Allah are equal to the number of souls. They don't mean there is more than one right path. What they mean is to get to that one right path, you don't all follow the same way. You don't all, for example, um, you know, join a Hawza and become an Ayatollah and then find Allah. Some of you will find Allah by being a baker. Some of you will find Allah by being a candlestick maker or a shoemaker or whatever it is. You will go through different phases. Some of you will find Allah by being rich, some of you will find Allah by being poor, some will find Allah through their health, some will find Allah through their illness. And you'll go through different uh, intentions, desires, wishes, goals, um, and in all these different forms and stages, um, you will still find that your creator is one and the same. Then he asks them to ponder on something which is even more um, amazing from a human perspective, not from Allah's perspective, because to him it is all the same. He says, Alam taraw kayfa khalaqallahu sab'a samawatin tibaqa. Have you not seen how Allah has created the seven heavens in layers? Okay. Now, there could be uh, many reasons of what he is trying to say. Um, one example would be, look at for example, um, chapter 79 verse um, 27 in which Allah says Antum ashaddu khalqan amis sama'u banaha are you now my translation Okay, I'll translate what it says here, but the translation, rough translation. Are you more difficult to create or the heavens? He made them. Now from his perspective, it's nothing. Kun fayakun, whether he creates an ant, a human being, or the seven heavens, it's the same. But from your perspective, think about it. You study astronomy, light years, there are stars that are thousands and thousands of millions of times brighter and hotter than the sun. There are stars that have died trillions and trillions of light years away but we see them twinkling because their light has been traveling for trillions of years so the light is still coming to us but the star is gone right such a vast magnificent beyond imagination universe antum ashaddu khalqan right 
is it you whose creation is more prodigious or the sky which he built okay so this is an example in another example the same challenge you see chapter 31 verse um, 11 here Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala verse 11 right. he talks about from verse 10 he created the heavens without any pillars that you may see and he cast firm mountains in the earth lest it should shake with you and he scattered in it every kind of animal and we sent down water from the sky and caused every splendid kind of plant to grow in it all this then verse 11 he says Hada khalqullah this is Allah's creation now show me what others besides him have created. Okay. Rather the wrongdoers are in manifest error. Okay. Uh, so there are many such verses that essentially uh, give us the same meaning as what uh, Nuh has said. And uh, for those who may be interested I will just write down the verses without actually reading um, all of them here. All these verses are very similar in how Allah challenges people to say this is what Allah has created okay um, when Nuh says to them alam taraw kayfa khalaq Allah sab'a samawatin tibaqa have you not seen one possible meaning is he is telling them do you not already know okay which is very interesting because we have said time and again that Nuh was one of the earliest prophets when human beings were still in their infancy. So it tells us that even way back then, the idea of seven heavens already was known to the people of the time. Okay. Um, there are some, uh, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi says that there are some Mufassirun who say that actually um, from verse 13 onwards, it is not news speech and it is just Allah speaking in general terms and it is actually Allah who is just revealing to his prophet and generally saying have you not seen how Allah has created the seven heavens in layers and so on and they argue the reason for this or the proof for this is that in verse 21 after this whole conversation ends at verse 20 in verse 21 it says again Qala Nuh and Nuh said so they say now Allah's conversation has ended and now Nuh is continuing again. But this is just uh, an isolated understanding. Most Mufassirun say no that's not the case. It is still Nuh talking to his people. The reason why verse 21 says Qala Nuh is because from verse 21 Nuh turns again away from speaking to the people and he starts lamenting to Allah again. You remember we said the last time there are segments in which he uh, speaks to the people then he laments to Allah then he speaks to the people again until verse 20 and then in 21 he starts lamenting again to Allah so Qala Nuh is just to redirect that conversation now towards um, Allah but as such he is talking to the people and saying do you not see how Allah has created uh, the heavens now obviously they did not see Allah creating the heavens and the earth and uh, chapter 18 verse 51 actually is very uh, clear it actually says you did not see the creation of the heavens and the earth so what he is saying to them is uh, do you not know and the idea is to observe the signs um, in the heavens another way to understand have you not seen how Allah has created the seven heavens in layers um, is to say do you not see how perfect the heavens are okay and if we have time we shall talk a little bit about the number seven and its significance the number seven can represent many things the number seven can represent perfection or completion and there is some evidence either in um, the Torah or in the Bible as well that represents seven as I think in the Bible there is this idea of seven representing perfection um, and in Islam as well um, I will give you a verse to show you that seven doesn't actually mean literally seven in number seven can mean infinite okay 
But there is another verse very similar to this, uh, which is chapter 67, verses 3 and 4. And in this you will see what I mean when I say, have you not seen how Allah created the seven heavens could simply mean, do you not see how perfect the heavens and the earth are? This is Suratul Mulk, which uh, many of us are familiar with. It's the first surah in the 29th Jews. Okay. In verse 3, first Allah says, he's describing his own self. He said, he created seven heavens in layers. The same thing. Then he says, You do not see any discordance in the creation of the all-beneficent. Meaning, you can't see any flaw, any mistake in God's creation. Then Allah challenges you. He says, فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرَةِ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ Look again, like stare at the heavens, look hard. Do you see any flaw? ثُمَّرْجِعِ الْبَصَرَةِ كَرَّتَيْنِ Then look again once more. يَنْقَلِبْ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَهُوَ حَسِيرٌ Your sight or your look will return to you, humbled and weary. In other words, you will get tired of looking, but you will not find any mistake or gap in what I have created. It is so perfect. Okay? And this is what Nuh perhaps in saying, do you not see how he is perfect in everything um, he has created? Okay. Um, there is also an interesting discussion on um, whether these seven heavens, I've mentioned that they may not be uh, literal, they may mean infinite. But even whether they are all physical realms or not physical realms. And I just want to dwell on that because I think it's an interesting discussion. Because the word sab'a samawat occurs many times in the Quran. And this discussion might actually change your perspective on how you understand certain verses of the Quran. Because the Quran has an outer meaning, a zahir, and then it has an inner batin meaning as well. Which we take from, uh, uh, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Um, but let me first give you the verse that um, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi uses to prove that seven could mean infinite. He says in chapter 31, verse 27, um, I'll just read the English translation here. Allah says, if all the trees on the earth were pens and the sea was replenished with seven more seas as ink, the words of Allah would still not be depleted, would still not finish or be spent. Okay? So he says here, this verse where Allah says, if all the trees were pens and all the seas, and you added seven more seas as ink, you would not finish the words of Allah. We cannot interpret this to mean as seven seas literally, because that would then suggest that if there were eight seas, then the ink would not finish. Right? So the, the idea of Sab'ata abhurin, seven seas, is literally meaning if you added infinite number of seas or as much ink as you could possibly imagine, you would still not finish the words of um, Allah. So he says here is an example of how seven does not necessarily mean uh, literal seven. Now, Alama Taba Tabai has a very interesting understanding of seven heavens. He says, if you study all the verses of the Quran, you will see that the verses that mention the planets and the celestial bodies, like the sun and the moon and the stars, the Quran is very clear that this is the lowest heaven or the lower heaven. And there are verses that clearly says, we have adorned the lower heaven with stars. Right? And we have made it beautiful for the one to gaze upon. Okay? If you've ever been to a place, it's hard to see that here in Toronto, but if you've ever been to a place where it's really dark and it's just filled with stars, it's just an amazing sight to see. Okay? All these verses suggest that these planets' bodies are all the lower heaven. Now, is there a physical canopy and then above that another canopy and things like that or not? Or are these just spiritual dimensions? This is the whole discussion. There are too many verses in the Quran where Allah says He created the seven heavens to actually deny the creation of these 
realms, whether we interpret the seven literally or say infinite. But what he created, these realms, are they all physical or are they literal? Here is what Allama Tabatabai argues. He says, we know from the Quran that besides the planets and you know, celestial bodies being in the lower heaven, the only other things or beings we know living in the other heavens are the angels. The angels themselves are created from light, from nur. And we have in hadith as well that their food or sustenance is tasbih. They sustain themselves and keep themselves alive by glorifying Allah. So he says this purity and angelic existence does not necessitate a very physical uh, um, world. Then he gives other examples. He says in chapter 32 verse 5, um, Allah says he directs the command from the heaven to the earth then it ascends to him in a day whose span is a thousand years of your reckoning okay. and uh, in another verse in uh, chapter 70 verse 40 he says the angels and the spirit meaning the ruh in Surah Al-Qadr we have on the night of Qadr the angels and the spirit come down. Here in this chapter it says the angels and the spirit ascend to him in a day whose span is 50,000 years. So these angels they ascend to him. But when they cross one day, 50,000 years have passed on the earth. So it is a world where time and space and our dimensions just don't make any sense there. Okay. Um, now, this obviously raises a lot of issues and questions. For example, in chapter 82, verse 1, the very first verse, it says, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فطرت, When the heavens are rent apart, when the heavens are torn apart. Now, if these heavens are not physical structures or canopies, then what is it that tears or rents apart? So we're not saying this or that because we don't know. We're just observing what the different scholars have said and how they've tried to justify their position and explain. One of the explanations they give is they say what happens um, on the Day of Judgment is the bridge between spiritual dimensions and our physical dimensions are, uh, the gap between us is bridged. And we certainly have access to that realm that we don't have access to in this world. For example, while we're in this world, when we look up to the heavens, we don't see the angels, but they're there. We don't see the devils, but they're there, right? We don't see the jinn, but they're around us. So there is a lot happening around us. There is a very vibrant living world, so much so that we're told in the heavens, there are so many angels, there is no room to even put a foot. And if we could see with certainty, and if veils were removed from our eyes, when we look up, we wouldn't see the blue sky. We'd just see it filled with angels bowing, prostrating, glorifying Allah, praying to Him. Okay? Then if you look at even authentic sources like Sahifa Sajadiya of Imam Zain al-Abidin we're told the earth is filled with angels. Every tree has an angel on it. Every mountain has an angel on it. Every raindrop that falls, there is an angel that brings it. And we're surrounded with so much around us that we don't see. Now these are spiritual realms that we don't have access to. So إِذَا un fatarat is when these veils are torn so that we now have access to that. Okay? And it's very interesting how they explain this. Uh, in chapter 14, verse 48, it says, The day when the earth is transformed into another earth and the heavens as well into another form of heaven. So there is a massive change and transformation that happens on the day of judgment so that our whole perception of reality changes. We suddenly wake up to a reality and realize that the life in this world was like a dream. Literally like just a moment of a pleasant dream or a nightmare that we woke up from and that is really what the real world is all about. But it doesn't stop there. Now. Look at, for example, and this verse I'll actually try and uh, uh, let's try and read it and quote it. 
chapter 7 verse uh, 40 okay what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you that when you come across a verse that explains this as literal and physical how do you think those who hold this as being a spiritual realm how do they explain it okay so chapter 7 verse 40 says indeed those who deny our signs and are disdainful of them the gates of the heaven will not be opened for them nor shall they enter paradise until the camel passes through the needle's eye okay now I would say to Allah Matabatabai if the heavens are not physical realms or if only the first heaven is physical and above that it's not then what does it mean the gates of the heaven will not be opened for them okay. the way he explains to it is that to enter paradise you have to be of a certain purity that you're able to access the spiritual realm of the pure so those who are transgressors okay those who turn away from the signs of God in pride the gates of the heaven will not be open for them means they will not have access to that spiritual world they will not have the ability to go through that quote unquote gate in the sense that they will not be able to understand or uh, live by those standards that would take them to paradise it is almost as if being in hell is being stuck in a lower dimension where you don't have um, access to certain um, spiritual bounties because everything in paradise is filled with even the physical is filled with a certain spiritual bounty right Muslims are often accused that their Quran preaches physical pleasure in paradise unlike other religions that promise spiritual pleasure but in paradise everything is that is physical has a certain spiritual um, pleasure to it as well when you drink the drink in paradise it increases your love for Allah and your knowledge of him okay so in that sense um, they would explain this first by no means does this of course answer all your doubts and questions and uh, there are so many questions that may come to mind one question that may come to mind is well Muslims say that Jesus peace be on him or Nabi Isa alayhi salam, ascended to the heavens so if the dimensions above the first heavens are not physical then how is Jesus in those dimensions right another question may come about um, that we say the black stone in the Kaaba the Hajar al-Aswad came down with Adam from the heavens well what heaven was this if it wasn't physical how did the black stone come or where did it exist before it came was this paradise on earth or was it there okay um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went for Mi'raj and it is a fundamental belief of the Shia that the Mi'raj was physical so if he physically ascended to the heavens then where did he go if those were spiritual realms did he physically ascend to a spiritual realm where he interacted with the souls of the prophets rather than their actual physical being are those prophets in those realms in the physical sense because paradise is what a place where people enter on the day of judgment so that brings a whole discussion on the world of where the prophets and the righteous live between this world and paradise right there is a middle world that we talk of as barzakh and that would open up a whole discussion and the Shia ulama have debated this with the Sunni ulama at length on this you know what do the Shias believe about their Imams where are their Imams do the Imams if the Imams are alive then their bodies are not are their bodies where their shrine is is their spirit also there if it's not then where does it reside do they reside in the physical sense or so it's a whole discussion and uh, the intention here is not to confuse you but to just uh, open up this idea that when you read the Quran understand that everything that you see literally can sometimes have multiple dimensions under it and you really have to take all the verses together and see why people argue in this manner versus that manner okay um, okay um, I would like to get to verse 20 if I can um, 
it shouldn't uh, be as detailed for the remaining verses. So Nuh alayhi salam, um, I'm looking at verse um, 16 now. After mentioning the heavens, he says, وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا And he has made therein the moon as a light, and he has made the sun a lamp for you. And this is considered to be one of the scientific miracles of the Qur'an, that 1400 years ago, when people still believed the earth was flat and was the center of the universe, the Qur'an is describing the sun as a lamp, meaning a source of light, and the moon as a nur, uh, which suggests something um, that gives light but takes from another source, as opposed to uh, having its own original light. And that's exactly what the moon is. It reflects light as opposed to the sun, which gives its own light. Okay, so many of the ulama have uh, mentioned this subtle but important uh, usage in Arabic where the sun is called Siraj and the moon is called uh, Nur. Now we know there are other stars that are brighter than the sun. But Allah mentions the sun and the moon because these are of direct benefit to human beings. So what Nuh is trying to say to them is that he created this for your benefit, essentially. Okay. Um, what is very interesting here is that if you look at chapter 33, verse 46, Allah describes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he calls him Sirajam Munira. He uses both Siraj and the Nur as Munir. Right? A radiant lamp. And this has not escaped the attention of the Mufassirun that he has actually called the Prophet a sun and a moon. And if we understand this basic idea that the sun gives its original light and the moon reflects it, then in what sense is the Prophet both Siraj and Munir at once? Okay? In one sense, um, like one of the Mufassir, for example, says that he is Siraj in that he removes the darkness of kufr or faithlessness. And he is Munir in the sense that he reflects the Tawheed of Allah on creation. Okay? But I have a better understanding of that as well, um, which is one could suggest that the Prophet to begin with and all the A'ima as well, uh, as we know, they are both Hadi and Mahdi. Hadi is one who guides. Mahdi is one who is guided. Guided by Allah. Okay? And all the Imams have this title. We use Hadi for the 10th Imam and Mahdi for the 12th Imam, but all the Imams, in Ziyarat Warid, for example, we refer to Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, we say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ الْإِمَامُ الْبَرُّ الْتَقِيُّ الرَّذِيُّ الزَّكِيُّ الْهَادِيُّ Mahdi. That Mahdi is Imam Hussein. That you are a guide and you are one who is guided by God. Okay? So, in that sense, the Prophet, peace be on him and his family, um, he is both a guide for others, but he's also guided by God. So, he has his own light that he gives to people in being a guide, and he also reflects Allah's light or nur. And so, he's both Siraj and uh, nur as well, or Munir. And there are many verses where sun and moon have been mentioned. Then, thereafter, Nuh says, Wallahu ambatakum min al ardi nabata. And Allah made you grow from the earth with a vegetable like growth. Okay? This nabat is normally used for plants. And it's very interesting that Allah compares the creation of human beings with a plant. And if you look at the verses carefully, you see that. In verse 14, he mentioned the creation of human beings. Then in verse 15 and 16, he mentioned the heavens. Now he's come back to mentioning human beings. And then again, in verse 19 and 20, he mentions the earth, because the heavens and the earth normally are mentioned together. And this contrast is perhaps to show that a human being is really um, a microcosm of the macrocosm. Like there is a whole, the whole universe is really within us. And to understand what is without, we must understand what is within. Okay? There is a verse in Quran as well where Allah says, uh, in, in chapter 41, verse 53, 
He says, we shall show them our signs in the horizons and in their own souls. Fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim. Until they know that this is the truth. Okay? So the truth is understood not only by reflecting on the creation and the signs, but also in reflecting on your own existence and how you were created and how your body functions, um, your origin and so on. And this likening of the human growth to a vegetable-like growth is very powerful. In many ways, we resemble the vegetation of the earth. Okay? Um, like most vegetation, for example, that go through spring, summer, fall, winter, human beings have the same thing. Our infancy is a spring, then our, uh, as we become adults, we go through our summer, then as we grow old, we go through our fall, autumn, right? We weaken the same way, and then we have our winter, which is our death. And we sustain ourselves by eating from the vegetation of the earth, or by eating the flesh of animals that feed on the earth. So ultimately, our source of food is the earth. Okay? And then when we die, just like you know, the dead trunk of a tree that gradually rots and mixes with the earth and fertilizes it, we die, our body mixes with the earth, and we give new life to the earth. Perhaps you know, other vegetation grows. And from that vegetation, animals eat that vegetation, and other human beings eat that. So there is a whole cycle. Um, also in the verses that talk of the creation of the human being, how we are, you know, from a drop of fluid, we are like a mass that clings to the wall of the womb. You see that idea of vegetation or growing like a plant, uh, very much like that. The earth as well dies in winter, and then when it rains and it warms again in spring, the earth comes back to life. Human beings the same way Allah tells us, um, in, in many places, like in chapter 35, verse 9, Allah compares the resurrection of human beings to um, the revival of a barren land through rain. Just how he brings rain and he makes a land that is infertile to be fertile again, he compares the resurrection of human beings like that. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, analogies and comparisons. And Nabatan uh, Ambata to, to, to give this growth like a plant also suggests a very delicate growth, like the growth of a flower that blooms and blossoms. Um, when Allah talks about how he looked after uh, Maryam salam, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, he uses this term in, in, in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 37. Um, he says, and he made her grow up in a worthy fashion. But if you look at the Arabic, it says, وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا In other words, uh, um, it's almost like saying we... Give me a minute here. Suggesting a very um, delicate uh, looking after and growing. And then verse 18 says, ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا Then he will make you return to it, meaning to the earth that he brought you from. وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا And he will bring you forth again without uh, fail. Now, for those of you who are, again, interested in uh, you know, the delicate and subtlety of how the Qur'an chooses words, especially those of you who understand some Arabic, this verse is very interesting. Uh, Alama Taba Tabai says uh, that if you notice this verse, when it starts, Allah uses the word thumma. Okay, he says thumma. Then, Okay, thumma yu'idukum fiha. He will make you return to it. Um, but then, when he talks of bringing you back out again, he doesn't say thumma yukhrijukum. He says wa yukhrijukum. Okay. Now, um, in Arabic, this conjunction particle 
were is a little less uh, you know it, it doesn't disjoint things from the previous statement like the word thumma thumma suggests a whole new stage were suggests almost a continuation and he says perhaps you see Allah talks about how he created you from this earth like a vegetation growth then thumma there's a major change here he returns you to the earth but then he doesn't say thumma then again as another new milestone and another new step he brings you forth he just says wa yukhrijukum which suggests that the last two stages which is of death and the resurrection are very similar that is why there isn't such a clear thumma between them there is a wa and he actually explains it as follows he says unlike this world which is known as the abode of illusion and deception dar al ghurur uh, and there are verses where the world is mentioned as Dar al Ghurur, the, the, the abode of deception. The world of death and the world of resurrection are the world of reality, what is called Dar al Haq. And that is why they are kept together with the work conjunction as opposed to the uh, Thumma. Okay. Now, the final two verses uh, in this uh, segment, he says. Wallahu ja'ala lakum al arda bisatan. And Allah made the earth a vast expanse for you. Litasluku minha subulan fijaja. So that you may travel over its spacious ways. So um, the word Allah is repeated again in this verse just for magnification. Uh, instead of saying, and He. Uh, and he made the earth a vast expanse. In verse 17 it mentions Allah. In verse 19 again it mentions Allah. It doesn't just use the pronoun he. That is just to magnify. Uh, Bisat is actually a rug or a carpet. And so when, when it says, and he, uh, Allah made the earth Bisatan for you. It says here a vast expanse. What it brings to imagination is he unrolled it like a carpet. For you, okay. It is very similar to um, chapter 79, verse 30, um, which says, "Wal arda ba'da dhalika dahaha," and after that, He spread out the earth for you. We have a day when we mark Dahul Ard. Dahul Ard is the day when the earth was rolled out like a carpet in that sense, okay. And and uh, this is what Nuh is saying to them. Uh, Subulan fijaja, subul is the plural of sabil, which is a way or a path, and fijaja is from fudge, is the plural of fudge, and it suggests something spacious, okay, or it even suggests a pass between two mountains. So subulan fijaja can mean a wide path, or it can mean a path between mountains, and. Uh, what the ulama tell us here is that one of the things that Nuh is inviting the people to reflect on is how Allah has been gracious to us in creating this earth. Look at how he made the earth so conducive to human beings as if he created it just for us. It's not too coarse. It's not too slippery, right? Allah could have made the earth like glass or ice everywhere, right? It's just perfect for us to tread upon. It's not so hard that we can't dig and plant and grow our food. We can actually cut through the earth and build roads and mount through mountains for ourselves. Look at how human beings have been able to spread themselves throughout the planet and populate the planet because of their ability to dominate the earth. Okay? Yet it's not so soft that we would sink inside it everywhere we go. Right? Then he filled it with treasures, the minerals, the oil, the gas, right? So we are able to travel on it for pleasure. We are able to take from it and build our homes. Look at the homes we build. What do we build? In the olden days, they would take the mud and build and straw and build their huts. Now we build skyscrapers. But where does the plastic and the iron and the glass and all come from? From the earth. So we are not really creators. We are only movers. Allah is the creator. All we do is we move things from one place we burn, we melt, we smelt, we take out different ores, different minerals, we reconstruct it, we build structures, and then we say, I made this. 
I built the car, I built the house. But all we're doing is we're moving things around. That's all. We are movers. We're not really creators of anything. Okay? Um, and so this is what he is saying, that look at how Allah has made this earth uh, a vast expanse so that you may travel over its spacious ways. In other words, he has made it so subservient to you, despite the fact that as human beings we are inherently weak. Even physically, we are one of the weakest creatures on this earth. But we dominate all the other creatures. We can take any creature and put him in the zoo. Right? Because of Allah's blessing that he made us, uh, uh, gave us the ability to dominate and um, make all things subservient to us. And I think this, um, I just want to confirm there is, um, Yes, um, perhaps with, with the blessing of this occasion, we end with one nice uh, hadith on this seven heavens and stars. Uh, there are some hadith that say to us that the stars that Allah created are a safety for the people of the heavens, right? And as long as they exist, the people, the angels who inhabit the heavens are safe. On the day when the stars fall away, then that is the day of judgment, where the angels as well are disturbed and their world also is destroyed. For the people of this world, what we're told is that Allah will always have a proof or a hujja, an imam on this earth. As long as there is one hujja or one proof on this earth, the earth will subsist. When there is no proof of Allah on this earth, that day the earth ends. Okay? And so we have many hadith that says, if there was no Imam, the earth would just collapse. Okay? So we have a beautiful hadith here um, on this uh, tafsir of, do you not see how he created the seven heavens? Um, we have, uh, let me see who is, uh, the, the, let me see the source of this um, hadith. The source is actually tafsir al-mizan of Allama um, Tabatabai. Um, he says, Muhammad bin Ibrahim wrote to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and said to him, tell me what is so special about you, the Ahlul Bayt? There is almost a sort of, you know, um, audaciousness to this. He writes to him, tell me what is so special about you, the Ahlul Bayt? So Imam al-Sadiq wrote back to him and said, indeed the stars have been made a safeguard for the inhabitants of the heavens. So when the stars of the heavens are gone, what was promised to the inhabitants of the heavens will come to pass, meaning the end of the universe as we know. And the messenger of Allah, peace be on him and his family said, my Ahlul Bayt has been made a safety or an aman for my Ummah. So when my Ahlul Bayt is gone, what is promised to my Ummah will come to pass. Wassalam. This is the importance of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay. So, um, we, we end with uh, this, inshallah, and then uh, we will try and record the remaining uh, uh, tafsir of this surah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali baytihi tayyibina tahirin.